Good afternoon. This is Rich Nass, Executive Vice President with Open Systems Media. I am here for this week's installment of Five Minutes With, and this week I'll be speaking with Ray Zinn, who I'm sure you know is the former longtime CEO of Micrell. Afternoon, Ray. How are you? I'm doing very fine. Thank you so much for asking. Oh, you're quite welcome. Okay, so as I said, and as people already know, you are the longtime CEO of Micrell. Um, one of the things that I found extremely interesting about your tenure there is that um, you sustain profitability even th- even through you know the the leanest of times, and some of the times were really lean. And uh, you know there aren't too many people out there who can say that they maintain profitability. How the heck did you manage that? Good question. So um, I had a policy that I would never let expenses increase um, greater than the prior quarter. So in other words, you. The, even though the revenue was climbing, uh, I made sure the expenses remained the same as they were in the prior quarter. In fact, you had to, we had to have two quarters where the revenue was increasing by X percent, and then they could increase the expenses proportionally after that six months period. So the prior uh, 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 the prior expense area was kept fixed for at least six months. That that's presuming that the uh, revenue was, was increasing, too, at, at some percentage. And then let's say that if the revenue was increasing 5% in that quarter, then they could have the expenses increase uh, 5% uh, or something in that neighborhood, but not greater than, the, uh, than, than what the revenue growth was. So that's the way I did it. And by doing that, that helped me maintain that profitability for those uh, you know, 36 out of 37 years. Another thing that we were very good at doing – was forecasting the industry's growth. Uh, so for the past 15 years, I was able to forecast the industry's growth within 1%. That helps me then understand the macro environment so that I made sure that, that um, uh, I, again, controlling expenses, knowing which way the direction of the industry was, was going to head, I could uh, uh, ensure that uh, we maintained the proper uh, expense level. So did you have that same visibility? I mean, even, I, I mean, there had to be some quarters where you were scratching your head. I mean, you know, in the 2008 time frame, I mean, it was, it was pretty hard to predict. I mean, were you accurate even in those times? Yes, we were. We, we actually forecasted that downturn uh, uh, within 1%. And uh, even though it was huge, uh, a massive drop, uh, that we were able to control that. Now, let's – not confuse the numbers that uh, that we would have internally the, the the you know the the growth projections or the you know, the growth level revenue level that we were projecting uh, would not necessarily be what we told the street. So because uh, we were a public company, we wanted to make sure we we hit our street numbers. So if you look at my track record, <clears throat> while maybe I didn't always hit my revenue numbers, I always hit my earnings. Um, uh, and, and very, very seldom did I ever miss the earnings by more than a penny. So um, that's because, because we had a very predictable model. <clears throat> we could model ourselves very, very accurately. So I, I had a revenue model for every I – mean, excuse me, I had an expense model for every revenue uh, level that I had uh, seen or projected for the next 10 or 15 years. Okay. And then we made sure we, we managed a company to that model. So I guess I'm guilty of focusing on the negative here. Let's talk about like the 2001 where um, it had to be just as hard to predict because revenues were going up, 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 up. Um, were you as accurate at that point as well? Yes. Back in May of 2000, uh, I predicted the industry would roll over uh, in, in the September, October time frame of 2000. And so we, we absolutely uh, hit it right on the head. Uh, it's a matter of record. Uh, if you go back and, and look at, uh, at, at, those, at that time period, the, um, uh, the projections that we gave for the industry at the um, – uh, I'm trying to remember the, the conference that I was at. Uh, I think it was the Montgomery Conference in those days. Uh, and then the uh, analysts, when they were sitting around the table with us and the investors – I, I predicted in May uh, when they had that conference, I predicted that in September we'd start seeing the bookings roll off. Uh, and so they went ahead and, and, and published that in July and took credit for it. 
but they called me first and said, are you sure your numbers are right? And I said, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm confident of it. Lo and behold, they came out with a report uh, predicting it uh, back in, 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 in July or August of, of, of 2000. So uh, they got the credit for it, but I'm the one that gave them the heads up on it. So, but uh, we were definitely uh, you know, ready for, for that downturn when it, when it hit. Now, <clears throat> we lost almost half our revenue uh, in, in 2001, uh, going into 2002. But since we were prepared for it, it didn't hurt us. I mean, it hurt us, but it didn't, it didn't sink us. So we were still profitable. Um, I was unprofitable in, in, in by barely, by $50,000, I was unprofitable in 2002 because I had to consolidate two fabs down to one. Why? Because I didn't need the capacity with that downturn that occurred uh, in 2001. So um, kn- knowing your industry, being able to project ahead is, is really the, the key to uh, surviving these, um, these dramatic uh, cycle changes. I think I need to have you talk to my financial guy because he didn't do nearly as well as you did. <laughs> well, you know, neither did a lot of other companies. That's for sure. Okay. So um, what are some of the hard lessons that you learned along the way? I think the most difficult lesson for me, because I founded the company and, and ran it for 37 years, was the impact that the uh, active investors would have on, on us. Uh, again, you know, I was used to investors investing in the company because they agreed with the, with the dynamics of the company, the model the company was running to, and in you generally don't invest in a company unless you um, are, are happy with the, the management style uh, of the company. And having run it for, for, for many, many years before it even went public, uh, I just assumed that the investors who um, um, bought the stock were aligned with, with, the, uh, with the methodology and, and the direction of the management. But the activists don't do that. They, they're in it for just a year. And so they, they don't care if, you, if they're aligned with management. They just want one thing, and that is the stock price to go up. And uh, if that if doesn't happen, then they're going to rattle your cage and, uh, and, and make your life miserable until you do something. So they're, they're, they are not aligned usually with management. And that was the biggest lesson for, for me, I think. Knowing what you know now, you know, hindsight's obviously twenty twenty. What would you have done differently? Well, uh, <laughs> probably not went public, you know. I mean, now I'm saying that, you know, in retrospect, but uh, uh, certainly uh, the, the, they're – at least in this day and age, being public is not all it's cracked up to be. So um, even Yahoo and, and others have, have felt, the, and Hewlett Packard have felt the sting of the, of the investors, activist investors who come in and try to, to cause change. Um, and uh, and it's, not, it's not necessarily to the advantage of, of other shareholders or for sure to, to the company itself, especially if you want to have a sustained uh, company. So... Uh, when we got hit in in 2008 by Obram Capital, which is an activist firm, we beat them. But this time, the board I have, my current board, uh, did not have the stomach to to fight the activists and decided again to put the company up for sale. Well, that begs the question, though: Why did you go public in the first place? Well, it was I don't know. Back in those days, uh, it was the kind of thing to do. We went public in '94, and those are pretty good days. And and uh, so. Uh, you know, do good things go on forever? No, you know, uh, you know, times change. I mean, you know, the the, the, the political environment changes, the, uh, the the view of the investor changes with the low interest rates. Uh, you know, the mutual funds have not made as much money as they have in the past, uh, and and so they're more they're more picky, they're they're more aggressive with regard to to, to what they expect out of the out of their uh, their investments, uh, and and so. You know, from 94, I mean, back in those days, that was kind of the heyday of, of semis. Um, my, a lot of my, my cohorts, uh, Linear Technology and Maxim, all went public uh, in, in, that, in that time frame, and, they, and uh, they, we all did well. And so, uh, uh, and I did well, too. I mean, I did well up until uh, the downturn in 2001. Uh, the micro stock was was just sky- skyrocketing. And at one time, we had a market cap over seven billion dollars. It was unrealistic, but it still was a, was a huge growth for the for us. So we were all happy we were public from '94 to 2000. But then, after that, then you know the the, the economy changed and, and and life changes. But 
you know, once you're public, it's hard to go private again. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it's happened, as, and there's a couple of examples, but um, I, from what I understand, it's a pretty painful process. Very, very painful. So aside from the public, non-public, for somebody who's thinking up of doing a startup, what advice would you offer? Well, um, you know, as I look forward in, in, in my career going forward, uh, I'd like to do some mentoring uh, to, to companies and startups, and, and I call it mentor capitalism. capitalism. Um, and, and so the companies that I'm going to invest in or would like to invest in um, uh, really should read my book. I mean, I, I, I spent a lot of time writing that book, uh, uh, putting down the, all the lessons I had learned, and so um, I'd like them to read my book. Uh, if, they, if they still uh, are of the mind to, uh, to move forward with a startup, um, I wouldn't mind talking to them and seeing how I can help them. But definitely um, they, they have to have a heart into it, and they, they have, I know this sounds strange, but I'd like them to read my book first and, and see if that's, if, if they've got the heart to do this. So, um, yeah, read tough things first, and, and then uh, that, that's a good basic textbook for companies, uh, for startups, not just, I should say, for startups, but for any company. These Very are good, good, sound business principles. Okay. And that was Tough Things First, Leadership Lessons from Silicon Valley's Longest-Serving CEO. Correct. Ray, I'm afraid we've significantly exceeded our five minutes, so we're going to oh. have to cut this off, but... Uh, I, I thank you for your time. This has been uh, very good insight, and I'm sure that a lot of people will find this valuable. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you allowing me to come on your program. That was Ray Zinn. He is the former CEO of Micrell, and I am Rich Nass, the Executive Vice President of Open Systems Media. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome. Thank you.